Hey everybody, this is George from Dinosaur George from San Antonio, Texas, answering questions from people from around the planet. Let's dive into it. We will start with David from Wirt Holland. He said, Dear Dr. George Blassing, David, I appreciate the courtesy, but I am not a doctor. I do not have my degree in paleontology, just so that you guys all know. I am not a degreed paleontologist. I've spent my entire life studying the uh, subject, and I probably own every textbook that's ever been written about paleontology, but I am not a degreed paleontologist, so I'm not a doctor, but thank you very much. Although I play one on TV. <laughs> I've always wanted to use that line. All right, David says, I have two questions for you. Why is it that small theropod dinosaurs like Cynoceropteryx and ornithopod dinosaurs such as Struthiomimus are mostly found in a head swung over the body and tail pointing up position? David, good man, brilliant, brilliant question. Um, there's a lot of... Um, um, uh, debate about why those dinosaurs tend to die that way. And it's not just limited to the small ones. I've, I've seen an Albertosaurus who died like that. Um, some people believe that um, when the dinosaurs die and the fluids from their body begin to um, uh, uh, not dissolve, what's the word I'm looking for? Evaporate. It's a good word. As the fluids begin to evaporate from the body, there are elastic-like sinews that run down the length of the back of the neck and all the way down to the base of the tail. And the idea is that as they dry up, uh, desiccate, as they dry up, those elastic rubber band-like things begin to contract. Well, if they do, and you have one on the end of your tail and one on the end of your head, as they shrink and contract, it causes the body to ultimately curve this way, so your head's here and your tail's here. And that gives what we call the death pose. That's what I believe causes that. Uh, other, paleontology, or other, other, other people in paleontology disagree with that. They, um, uh, they feel that it's something else. I don't know what that something else is, but to my knowledge, that's what I believe would be able to do that. And it also suggests to me that it only happens when a dinosaur's body lays exposed, at least for a period of time, that would cause that. If the dinosaur died and was buried in mud and dirt, um, it's unlikely that the elastic band shrinking would be able to push and move enough dirt to cause its head and tail to move this way. I think it occurred when they were laying on the surface. Okay, his second question is, in some movies and video games, we see the large theropod dinosaurs, such as Allosaurus, use their tail to whip their prey and opponents. I know that sauropods, such as Diplodocus, could and would probably have done this in the event of, of danger, but do you think that a theropod would do it? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think a theropod would use that as uh, its number one source. Um, certainly, absolutely, it would utilize anything necessary to take down prey. Now, maybe in combat between males, they may have utilized their tail as a way to, to whack the other guy in the chest. Have you ever watched giraffes? Man, giraffes battle like crazy, uh, and they utilize their head to do that. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, 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 theropods didn't use it, but the reason why I hesitate saying that theropods probably did is because if they utilize their tail a lot, I think we would find a much greater number of broken and healed bones in theropod tails. And I don't still see that many. Maybe there are, and I'm just unaware of it. But I don't think they would have used that much. But in the heat of battle, listen, man, I think those things would have used anything available to them. They would have been biting, scratching, pinching, kicking, spitting, throwing rocks, making small weapons. Okay, not doing all that stuff. But anyway, I think they would have used whatever they needed at that time. All right, Gib from Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, how are you? Gib, I'm doing great. Uh, nice to hear from you. Which dinosaur can beat a Tyrannosaurus Rex? And then he says, thank you. First of all, Gib, thank you for the good manners. Um, which dinosaur could beat Tyrannosaurus rex? Well, that's, that's a, kind of a, an open question because there's a variety of dinosaurs that could beat a Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, things like Ankylosaurus would have had the armor and certainly the weaponry to cause some problems. Triceratops and basically all of the horned ceratopsians had the ability to beat a Tyrannosaurus rex. Another Tyrannosaurus rex could beat them. You see, we think of Tyrannosaurus as being the king of the dinosaurs, and that's what his name means, but no predator on Earth can be so effective that they can absolutely win every confrontation. Because if they could, they would literally eat themselves out of existence. So there's a lot of dinosaurs that could beat a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It just depends on the circumstances. 
All right, Ollie from South End, Essex, over in beautiful UK. Uh, hey, DG, I'm a big fan of, of your theories on T-Rex, and I think you're a really awesome person. Ollie, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. I'm looking in, into getting involved with paleontology, and you set a good example for me. Anyway, have you ever read the book Raptor Red, and are you a fan of Robert T. Bacher? If not, you should check it out. Ali, let me tell you something. First of all, uh, I'm very glad to hear that you are interested in paleontology. That's, that's great. Second of all, Dr. Robert Bacher is probably one of the nicest people in paleontology I've met. Uh, that man, every time I've met him, he treats me with such incredible respect and friendship. Uh, he truly, truly is, is one of my, one of my all-time favorite paleontologists. Yes, I've read Raptor Red, and it is a magnificent book. Uh, the last time I talked to Dr. Bacher, in fact, he was telling me that I think Disney bought the rights to turn it into a movie, and I am hoping and praying that they do. I would love to see Raptor Red as a movie. It is spectacular. It's a great book. Everybody needs to go out there and buy it. All right, uh, my buddy Alex from Manchester, England. Do you think that the French dromaeosaurids Pyroraptor and Veroraptor are the same thing? If yes, which name would be kept? Nice seeing you again, DG, and thanks. Alex, always great to hear from you, my friend. Um, you know, I've not had the chance to study Veroraptor at all, so I don't know if indeed it is the same dinosaur as Pyroraptor, but that's certainly possible, and that happens a lot in paleontology. Um, which name would it get? That would, be depend, uh, that would be dependent on which name was given first. Um, if you find a dinosaur and you give it a name, and somebody else finds a dinosaur that they think is different and they name it, if it's ultimately proven that they're the same dinosaurs, whoever named it first, that's the name that becomes the valid name. So if Pyroraptor was discovered before Veroraptor, and they find that these are the same dinosaur, the name Veroraptor would be dismissed and it would be called Pyroraptor. Okay, finally, Connor from Shenandoah, Iowa. Hi, George. I read a while back that dinosaur remains were found in South America. Uh, I'm sorry, I read a while back that Spinosaurus remains were found in South America, which makes me wonder, are Giganotosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus, each similar animals in their own right and living around the same time, are they one and the same? That, Connor, is the essence of science. To look at things from a different point of view and question everything. It is absolutely possible that Carcharodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus uh, we know they're related, but it's certainly possible that they could represent the exact same species. Now, what can happen, my microphone almost just fell off, that's why I just jumped. Um, what can happen is um, uh, sometimes we see slight differences between species, and in some cases those differences are enough to make a paleontologist think they're looking at a new completely different animal, when in fact those variances may just simply represent the fact that, like you and I, we all have a little bit of differences. Now, I have heard on a number of occasions that people that have looked at both Giganotosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus all come to the conclusion that they are indeed two distinctively separate species, even though they're closely related. Um, I've never had the opportunity to study them up close and personal, so I can't tell you. I do know that looking at Carcharodontosaurus' skull and, and Giganotosaurus' skull, they look very very, very similar, and I don't know what the differences are. Um, so it's certainly possible. All right, everybody, that's it for now. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, fill out the form and submit it. Um, we will do our best to answer your questions. We get a thousand of these things a month, and I just can't possibly get them all. So keep trying if you've written and I haven't responded. Until next time, everybody, you young people, practice your reading. Please become good readers. It's vitally important for anything you do, not just paleontology. And for everybody out there, let's all continue to use good manners and treat everybody the way you want to be treated and take care of yourself and take care of the others around you. See ya, see ya. Wouldn't want to be ya.